Well, good morning, and thanks for joining us here at uh, Crossroads Community Church. And uh, we just want to encourage you to just take a minute and where you're at, uh, no matter the room or the place or the building, to just uh, pause and just uh, choose to say yes to God and say, here I am, Lord, in the middle of all the chaos and the pandemic going on right now. Sometimes we just need to pause and take a step back and just say, Lord, let me hear from you. Let all of this noise around me just drown out. And that's what we're going to ask this morning as we come together and worship. Now, if you're in your, your house or you know, a friend's house or, or other room or this building, we just ask that you just stand with us as we just give back to our King this morning. Son of God, Lord, you are a daughter of God. Jesus, Jesus, we belong in the Father's house. In my Father's house, 
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. We declare that this morning with confidence, Lord Jesus. That we are your children. There's nothing that can separate us between you. God, there's nothing that we want more to just be in your presence, Lord. Jesus. Just sitting at your feet calms everything. Jesus. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me I just want you, Jesus, that's our prayer this morning. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet, Jesus. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want. for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you and I'm sorry and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sang another song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to Jesus. And I'm sorry when I've come with my forgot that you're enough take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you take me to your presence Lord I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than Nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, nothing else, 
nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else, Lord. And nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. And I just want you. And nothing else. fill us up, fill the cup up till it overflows, Jesus, let the brokenness come before you, and let your touch heal.
not be filled to the capacity that you want us to be. But when we take that first step, Jesus, it's in boldness and confidence that you give us, Jesus. 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 So we wait for you this morning. Jesus, we wait to hear your voice this morning throughout the week. Awesome. Wonderful. Hey, it's so good to have you uh, on our live stream this morning. I'm also excited to welcome some of our uh, leaders who are joining us this morning, the week before we officially open up. Leaders, could you guys make some noise and let our live stream family know you're here? Awesome. Awesome. So leaders, thank you so much. Uh, just want to, I, I just got to give some credit to our, our leadership team. You guys have been outstanding during this COVID time and have handled it with such maturity, such grace, such wisdom, and I'm so excited to get back to some normalcy. Somebody say amen. And so you guys have handled this entire situation, like I said, with, with just such elegance. So thank you so much for that. Media team, these past couple months have been um, very long days, long filming sessions, and as I've mentioned before, before COVID hit, um, our camera for live stream died. Praise God. And uh, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because had it died a couple weeks into COVID, technology equipment was getting bought up so quickly that they still don't have different cameras and parts and things that in stock. It got bought up in the first couple weeks of COVID, but thanks be to God, he knew what was coming. And so our 
older camera, less efficient camera, less quality giving camera died about a week before COVID hit and we ordered in the brand new one. And not only did it come in in something like, re- like two days, ridiculous like that, not only is it providing awesome quality, but we didn't have to uh, go a couple weeks without having the ability to live stream our family. Can you just give God some praise over that? He knew. Awesome. Awesome. I also want to thank you so much for tithing. Your continued um, faithfulness has been such a blessing to this church, not only enabling us to buy brand new equipment to get us through this time, but can I just say, and I'm, this is just God, and this is uh, the maturity of our church, which I am just so excited about. Um, We have not gone a week lacking anything financially. Um, As a matter of fact, our church's finances are looking healthy. Our church's finances are looking good. Thank you so much for your online, you know, your faithfulness and giving online. And more so than that, um, there were actually different blessings, financial blessings that came our way where individuals, you, you had such just a, a, a faithfulness heart, absolutely, but such a desire to bless this church. And you indeed have done so because we also received some extra blessings financially during this time, which how crazy is that? And so also, I, I just got to tell a quick story before we get on with uh, this morning series. Um, so uh, there was a meeting with different pastors from all over Pennsylvania, Delaware of the Assemblies of God Fellowship online. And one of the topics in the meeting is, are there any churches out there that are lacking financially? And if so, the district would like to you know, help you walk through this together. And there are around 420 churches in Pennsylvania and Delaware of the Assemblies of God. And to my understanding, this was about a month ago, but um, about a month ago, out of 420 churches that that question was asked to, not a single one said that they were in need. Not a single one. He's faithful. Also, just want to remind our online stream that our opening date, official date, is June 14th. Next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday, is our official opening day, and we are so excited to join you. I just want to throw out a reminder that we're splitting our services up into two services, one at 10 a.m. for those of you who may be in the at-risk category. We want to have an extra kind of safe environment, so 10 a.m. is going to be our, uh, our, our at-risk category service. It's going to be um, a little bit more simplified is a better way of putting it. We're not going to be doing any social interaction during the service. We're not going to have any greeters. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to be passing around an offer. Uh, a, a basket, but we're going to have a, a drop box for offerings and it's going to be like no touch whatsoever. And there's no kids ministry for first service. Second service, 1130 is whenever we're looking to have our uh, family friendly service. We'll be having kids ministry. It's going to be a little bit more relaxed, but it's not like we're going to be licking our hands and then high-fiving. Just want to throw that out there in case you're really excited to do that. Um, So just a reminder, 10 a.m. is the at-risk category. It will be ending around 11 o'clock, and then at 11.30 will be our family-friendly services of who may not be in the at-risk category. Um, I've had some questions as far as will will we be enforcing uh, mandatory mask uh, wearing, and at this point, uh, no, we will not. But if you would like to wear one, I don't want to deter you from that. If you choose to wear one, if you choose not to wear one, the choice is ultimately up to you. We haven't received any guidelines from the CD saying that it is mandatory and so on and so forth. So if you have any questions in that, uh, please feel free to reach out to us during this week. We're going to be providing some more details as to what some cleanliness protocols will be. For example, one of the things that we're going to be doing on June 14th is blocking off every other row so that we can space out. And uh, the other question that I've received is, is two services permanent? My immediate answer is no, it is temporary. We're doing two services not necessarily because we want to, but because because we need to in order to meet state requirements for kind of spreading out our congregation. I've also received recent questions, um, and this is a very sensitive topic. It revolved around the uh, racial division. There's no, there's no kinder way of saying it. Um, I received questions as far as C3 stance on what is happening in our culture right now. And I I just, as I expressed to my media team this morning, I said, I can't believe that here we are in 2020, and I actually have to say that racism is bad. Somebody, come on now. It, It blows my mind that that's where we are, that we have to say that. And the reason why I say it blows my mind that we have to say that is because I've always come with the upbringing that it's just assumed that you just know that it's wrong. And so our official stance is, as the body of Christ, we believe that equality is found at the foot of the cross. 
And I have heard many prophetic words given in our congregation of a multi-ethnic, diverse congregation meeting here. And I believe that that is going to come to pass someday. Amen? Where we're actually going to have, I believe that we're going to have to have multiple translators because we're going to be such a diverse congregation. But church, we also need to recognize that in order for that to happen, we have to build bridges. Amen? We have to build bridges. And so our official stance, I just want to clear that up, is um, I am of the belief that racism is of a spiritual demonic nature. I believe that racism is symptoms of what we see rooted deep down in somebody's heart. And I believe that the fix to what is happening in our culture, just as I mentioned in our devotional this past Wednesday, the fix to all of this is Jesus. Because in Jesus, there is equality. In Jesus, we have love for one another. There's a scripture that says there's no division among uh, uh, Jew or, or Gentile or Greek, or he, and, 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 and the scriptures give us such a clear depiction. When Jesus sits down at the well, he immediately said there's an equal playing field here because during biblical times when he sat down at the well to discuss with a woman at the well during that time, you don't do that. Women were looked at as lesser than, and yet Jesus had a conversation and sat down and had this dialogue. And then there was another group that often culture looked at and said, an an adult mature man has nothing in common with this group. And it was a group of children. And whenever the disciples tried to say, no, Jesus, you know, or excuse me, no kids, you can't come to Jesus. He doesn't have time. His words to the disciples, he said, let the children come to me. Can I just say that equality is found at the foot of the cross? And friends, I believe that if we preach Jesus, if we teach Jesus, then racism will be extinguished. Are you ready for this morning's sermon? We're heading into a series titled Roar, and I got to tell you that this series has had me messed up. This series has had me uh, weeping like a baby at times in, in, in my office. There's been other times where I felt the Lord calling me up here to pray over the room, to pray over our church in general, but most importantly, to pray over our nation. This series is opening up a part of me that, I, that I, I, I've never experienced before, and I'm hearing testimonies from other individuals who are feeling something spiritually turning. And as I mentioned in our devotional Wednesday, I believe that in times of brokenness and desperation, that those things, brokenness and desperation are the prerequisite to revival. And I believe that what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a generation that says, I am internally, I am spiritually discontent and empty. All of the things that we see in our culture right now have a dark spiritual undertone to them that I'm hearing people who don't even know Jesus. They're saying there's, there's a heaviness that I feel, pastor. There's a heaviness that I feel when I turn on the news. There's a heaviness that I feel whenever I start to discuss politics. And friend, I believe that that heaviness that you're feeling is of a spiritual nature. And the Holy Spirit, these past couple weeks in preparation for this series, has been messing me up. As a matter of fact, last night around 3.30 in the morning, I woke up to hearing footsteps in my house. My wife was laying asleep next to me. I checked on my girls and they were sleeping. So I didn't think about it. I said, okay, it was just a dream. And I went back to sleep and then woke up again hearing footsteps in my house. And in the midst of this event, me and my buddy Smith and Wesson took a walk. And so I'm searching around the house as if I'm in the midst of the Iraq war. And I'm looking and everything is all that it seems. Security alarms, good. Doors are locked. Everything is okay. And I started to realize that I said, God, I I know I heard footsteps. Our, Our stairs make a distinct noise when you're walking up and you reach the top of the stairs. There's a specific noise that happens. I said, I know that I heard that. And as I went back to bed, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and said, Donnie, why has the church welcomed the enemy into our home? Why has the church made a home for the enemy when we're supposed to be protecting what is righteous, what is holy, what is sacred? And just as I heard, I know I heard those footsteps, I felt the Holy Spirit said, what you're hearing is people making and opening up their home to their hearts to the enemy. 
somebody that I have not given permission to come into the home. And not only have we welcomed the enemy into our homes, but we've called him friend. I believe that for such a time as this, that God is calling the church to say, wake up, sleeper. It is time to arise and it is time to prepare for spiritual warfare. We're coming to a point in our day and age where, friend, attending church for the sole purpose of faithfully attending without intention of growing in relationship is not going to allow you to overcome anything. We're coming to a point to where showing up to church isn't enough. Faithfulness isn't enough. Fruitfulness must come into the conversation. If you and I want to make a difference, if you and I want to see change in our culture, Jesus is saying it is time to get and do things a little bit differently than you have before. It's time to pray a little bit more. It's time to get on your knees a little bit more. It's time to get spiritually deep. I believe that the church has a voice. And it's a strong voice. And it's an influential voice. I believe that the church has a sound and it is much like a roar. Have you ever heard a lion roar? The first time that I heard a lion roar, I'll never forget it. Walking into the Washington, D.C. Zoo, we weren't even through the gates. And I, I felt this rumble in my chest that shook me to my core. It was the lion yawning. And as we began to walk through this zoo, I heard the noise grow louder and louder and louder. Did you know that a lion's roar is about 147 decibels? To compare that, a shotgun blast is at 115. A lion's roar can be heard for almost miles and miles. I believe that the church has a voice much like a lion has a roar. And I believe for such a time as this, that Jesus Christ is calling out to the church, it's time to let out your roar. It's time to let out your voice. It's time to end compromise. It's time to take back what the enemy stole and get him out of the house. In just a moment, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. That's Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. Before we begin this morning, I must ask the question, why don't we hear the roar? What has happened that we now bow down and remain quiet to what culture tells us? Where has the church's voice gone? Before we get into the battle and the victory and the conquering and the courage that we have, we must pause and reflect and ask the question, where has it gone? What has happened to the church's roar that we have all become quiet? Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 7 says this, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And I know you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And you have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and that you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your timeless word. Your word that has spoken to us for thousands of years. Your word that does not fall void or hold, hold empty promises. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a church that we don't just read your word, but we walk in it and we abide in your truth. And I pray that your word would become our worldview, our moral standard, Lord Jesus. Father, unless your Holy Spirit is in the midst of this, everything that I speak is meaningless. So Lord Jesus, we ask your Holy Spirit to come. In Jesus' name we ask this. And everybody said? There's three things that we that must take uh, that must take action in order for us to restore the roar of the church. Three actions that we must take in order to restore the roar of the church. If we want to be an effective church, I'm convinced that we have to take these three things into consideration. And make no mistake, just as much as God is concerned for the church's faithfulness, He is also that much concerned for the church's fruitfulness. Church isn't set up to simply be a measurement of faithful church attendance. But Jesus had a plan to reach the world around us. And I want us to understand this this morning. Jesus had this incredible plan to reach the world around us, to go beyond borders, to speak truth. And his plan, his way of transporting this message out into the world was the local church, is the local church. Three things that I want to talk to you about today. There's three R's. Restore, return, refuse. Restore. There's something that must be restored in God's church that I want to bring our attention to this morning. Secondly, there's something that we must return to in order to restore the voice, the roar of the church And thirdly, there is something that we as the church must refuse to do in order for the roar to be restored in the church. The first R is this, restore the intellectual study and proclamation of God's word. Restore the intellectual study and proclamation of God's word. I've come to realize this, friends, that lions' roars have purpose. Did you know that? Lions' roar always has a purpose. They don't just do it for kicks and and thrills. There's a purpose behind the sound. And just like lions have a purpose behind their voice, so must the church. When lions roar, as a matter of fact, it, it is for the purpose of establishing location. It's them calling out to all the other prides in the area, all the other lines in the area area, and animals that would come against them saying, I'm here. Secondly, it's to protect and scare off predators. Don't you like that? Imagine, can you imagine this? Like like I just mentioned, I'm a gun owner. I love my gun, Smith & Wesson. Love it. But can you imagine if somebody broke into a, a house and they heard a lion roar? Didn't see that coming. I was prepared. I, just from a criminal's mindset, I was prepared for maybe a dog, maybe a, a, a gun owner, but a lion? I love it. Lions roar to protect and scare off predators, saying, if you come any closer, I not only want you to know I'm here, but I'm ready to do battle. Thirdly, a lion's roar, it warns their pride of danger. Just like it informs those who would come against them with violence, it also informs that violence is coming. Lions have a purpose behind their roar. They have a purpose behind their voice. We as the church must have purpose and meaning behind what we say. I believe that we've lost our war because we have little to no purpose in what we say anymore. We have become so concerned with what is tweetable that we say and repeat to one another phrases and sayings that carry little to no meaning or life-changing difference in them. We've recently lost one of the greatest apologists of our generation, An apologist is a philosopher, a theologian, if you will, who is specifically practiced and rehearsed to defend their faith. The individual that we lost goes by the name of Ravi Zacharias. And Ravi Zacharias, I would encourage you to check out some of the conferences and his sermons on YouTube. 
One of the things that Ravi Zacharias do, did is he would go to secular universities. They would put a mic in the center of the aisle, and Ravi would stand there and say, ask any question about my worldview, my belief, my faith. He was so rehearsed and studied in the word of God that he not only knew what he believed, but he knew why he believed that to be true. And Ravi Zacharias said this, we have become masters at engineering emotions without thought. Very little thinking happens in churches today. I'm going to say that one more time. We have become masters in engineering emotions without any thought. Very little thinking happens in our churches. Now, I want to be clear on this. I don't want us to feel guilty for having emotions. Let's recognize that God created emotions, right? God gave us emotions because often you'll find that he stirs up emotions in us to bring conviction or motivate us to do something or to not do something. But friend, there's a vast difference between us having an emotional response and making it all about an emotional response. And here's what I've come to know about emotions is that they have a shelf life. That you'll feel one way for one moment, and once you've walked out of that moment, once you've walked away from that altar, once you've walked away from that interaction, that, that emotion begins to subside, and so does the feeling that came with it, and soon you're right back to square one. When we base a church experience purely off of emotions, we are setting ourselves up for failure. But when we create a marriage between emotion, intellectual thought, and standing on God's truth, it makes all the difference and does not have a shelf life. Verse 2 says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, but hear, hear me out, but that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. Tested those who claim to be apostles. One of the fun facts about the early church is that the early church made it a point to test for correct doctrine. Hear me out. They did not take in and, and hold truth as equal until it was tested. I believe that one of the reasons why we have lost our voice in the church today is because rather than regarding very few things as truth, we have accepted everything as truth. The early church made it a point to test for correct doctrine before they made that doctrine a part of their life. In order to protect their life doctrine, they studied the word enough that they would test what other false teachers claimed. And it would come up to be false and therefore their doctrine was preserved. In our day and age, we must not only know truth, but know why we claim truth to be truth. In our day and age, we not only need to know what we believe, but the reasoning behind what we believe. There's a generation that's very broken and analytical that is rising up, and they have a lot of questions. And my biggest fear is that I don't know if the church is prepared to answer the questions that they have. There's a generation that is being taught a, that, that relativism is doctrine. There are no absolutes in life. If your doctrine contradicts itself, it's okay, because after all, there's no absolutes. And this generation is being taught that everything is relative, that morality is relative, the way that you lead and live your life is relative, everything through their lens is relative. And they've been taught this doctrine from kindergarten through graduate school. And I'm seeing this life doctrine take down more Christians than what we have time to discuss today. Christians who have compromised on their fundamental beliefs for the sake of building a bridge, pastor. Who have compromised on God's truth because, well, pastor, I don't want to be offensive. Can I tell you that the word of God is offensive? Jesus says that it divides. It separates. To cut something off is a painful process. And that's what his word does. It cuts off the pieces of us that were never supposed to become a part of us. Hallelujah. 
There's a generation that's being taught that everything is relative and their worldview is therefore based. Their life philosophy is based that everything is relative. And friend, here is my concern. When you teach that everything is relative, then the value that humanity has is diminished. That which God created to be sacred is taught to be unsacred. When everything is relative... When we say there's no absolutes, we've just welcomed the enemy into our home. And I'm hearing Christians who are prepared to, hear me out because we're going to get real this morning. They're prepared to defend a president, but they're not prepared to defend the word of God. That's a problem. When we lead people to Jesus, the symptoms that are rooted in spiritual warfare will be taken care of. Can I tell you that hope is not found in a political party? It never was, it never will be. I am not diminishing the value of politics either because I recognize that we are so easily swayed from one extreme to the next. I believe that Christians have a mandate to vote. Can I say that? Do I have to say that this morning? That we have a mandate to vote. I cannot imagine in the Christian life, which I've heard so many times, that people base their voting off of other things aside from abortion. Can I just tell you that from my perspective, when 900,000 babies are being slaughtered every year, that's a cause to stand up and vote. But it can't be all about voting. Spirit and in truth, we have to be prepared to defend what we believe because here's what I realize is political stances are the branches of what's happening spiritually. Friends, we have not We have got to focus on more than symptoms. Come on, somebody. If I go to a doctor, I don't want him to just help me suppress the symptoms. I want to get down to the root of the problem. Is this making sense this morning? The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple enough for a child to understand it, and yet it is complex enough to take up a philosopher's entire life without him or her ever running out of things to think about or learn about. Let's do more than just hear the word of God, friends. Are you ready to prepare for battle? Because we like the sound of that. But preparing for battle takes study, questioning. And the Bible opens the door and says, test all things and hold on to what is true. For the sake of having something with substance to speak, we must Study the word of God philosophically. In order to have meaning behind our voice, we have to make sure that what we are speaking has substance and isn't just a rehearsed Christian language. Come on, somebody. Because, friend, there's a generation that is dying for truth. And I just want to offer you some encouragement today. As we discussed with our prayer team this past Wednesday, I understand that the media portrays this generation. I mean, obviously, every clip you see of rioters, you say, my God, what good could possibly come out of this? And everything that we see on the media, the disunity... The anger, the hurt causes us as Christians, and I'm admitting this firsthand, that we become discouraged. And I get that. Because up till the prayer meeting this past Wednesday, it was really difficult to walk with a healthy perspective. Don't make me feel alone now. It's heavy. And I get that. But friend, can I tell you that when God gets a hold of a passionate generation, the things that he can do in them and through them will blow your mind. When there is a generation that takes as much passion as they're pouring out into these other things and they pour that passion into Jesus, are you hearing what I'm saying? There's hope, friend. 
there's hope in Jesus because I recognize that my God is still in the business of taking what was broken, what was messed up, and making it whole and beautiful. And I have to believe that what he did in past generations, come on somebody, he can still do for this generation. We must be speaking life. I'm not saying that we're blind to the reality of what is happening in front of us, but I'm saying that what is happening in front of us should cause something in us to say, I have got to speak that much more truth over this generation. They are not lost. They are not buried. They are planted. Come on, somebody. There is a vast difference between when something is buried and when something is planted. When they buried Jesus in the tomb, they didn't realize that he wasn't buried. He was planted, that there was something happening. And I believe that the generation that we see is not hopeless. All is not forgotten. They are simply planted. And whenever the Holy Spirit begins to water over that plant, that there's going to spring forth a new version, a passionate version of Christianity like we've never experienced before. They're not buried. They're planted. We must make sure that we are intellectually studying the word of God. Secondly, returning to our first love. If we want to restore the roar of the church, we must return to our first love. Revelation 2 verses 4 through 5 says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you first did. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The church of Ephesus lost their warmth. The culture during this time, this church, just to put it in perspective, was surrounded by demonic pagan beliefs. That's a heavy situation. And what the scripture teaches us is that there was a warmth that they had that they had lost. A concern for those around them. They lost their desire to show Christ-like love. Here's what I've come to recognize is that we often seek to use truth in order to win an argument rather than to win a person to Jesus. In our culture, we've made it a habit to use the word of God to win an argument rather than winning a person to Jesus. In how you approach a disagreement, if you're trying to simply win the argument or win the person to Jesus, depending on, depending on which one you're trying to accomplish will drastically change the way that you approach the conversation. As the church, I believe that We've grown so cold and overwhelmed that it's become all about winning arguments rather than winning people. Their love for Christ didn't spill over anymore. One of the things that set this church apart is that their love for Jesus spilled over and caused them to love one another. And that love spilled over into the culture around them. Now you must see how different, as we head to a close, how different this was compared to other belief systems. And it is still what sets us apart today. The belief systems, the pagan belief systems in this society were cold. And maybe I'm the only one who's noticed this, but the belief systems in our world still today are cold. And what set this church so drastically apart is that this church had an approach that said, you have nothing to prove to us. No matter what background you come from, we're going to love you. And we're going to accept you. We might not accept and approve of your beliefs, But first, I'm going to accept and approve of you because you are made in the image of God just like me. In order for us to restore the roar of the church, friend, we've got to get back to the warmth. And can I just say, I'm a little biased in this, but that is something that I am so C3 proud of. Is when When I define our church, 
I find myself first describing us as warm. Let's protect that. Amen, church? Hold on to that. Never allow what's happening in the world to allow our hearts to grow cold. Let us always be known as a church that is warm and shows the love of Jesus. Amen? Here's what I take hope in, though. To leave something means that we can return to it. When you and I forget something, we can go back and pick it up. When you and I are looking for our car keys because we left it somewhere, we can go back, find the car keys, and then go places that we weren't going prior to. Do you see where I'm going? When you and I return to that first love with Jesus... He doesn't hold us walking away over our heads, but we picked up where we left off and then he takes us to places that we've never been. That's grace. Amen, pastor. Amen. Amen. And what's so beautiful is Jesus always says, here's the problem. Here's to fix how to fix it. He says, remember, he was calling us to recognize where we are now versus where we were before. I heard somebody say this uh, to me to define what backslidden means. He said, if you can remember a time when you were more passionate and more in love with Jesus, as opposed to where you are now, you've backslidden. If you recall greater days than what you're currently experiencing, we've walked away. Remember and recognize I ask you this, do you have that zeal, that passion, that excitement in your heart, just like when you first came to know Jesus? Do you still have that excitement of of when you first walked away from the altar where you accepted Christ and just something was different? It was kind of that feeling of like, man, you got to get some of this. It was that sense of, how how do I tell others about this? Do you still have that? Are you still experiencing those moments where God opens up your heart and all you can do is sit there and say, God, you are sovereign. Those things that God does in your heart that propel you to do other things, are you still experiencing that? Jesus says to recognize, repent. To respond, to not only recognize where we've, where we've fallen from or where we've walked away from, but to repent, to seek reconciliation. And then Jesus says, I'll restore you. To bring back to life the practices that lead us to fruitfulness. Mike, would you come? My last point with you this morning is this. We must refuse compromise. If we want to restore the voice of the church, we must refuse compromise. I'm not talking about it being wrong for us to do things differently. I heard a pastor say one time, the method change. The method changes, but the message never should. And I believe that one of the reasons why we as a church, and I'm not speaking specifically to this location, I'm talking about church in the United States of America. One of the things that that we've done is with changing the method, we have completely changed the message. Revelation chapter 2 verses 6 or 7 says this, Yet you have this, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now we have to understand what the Nicolaitans were known for. And let me know if this sounds familiar. Nicolaitan church was a sect within the church that had worked out a compromise with a pagan society. They did this by primarily teaching that spiritual leeway and grace gave them permission to participate 
in idol worship and pagan immorality. They had worked out a compromise, friends, that said grace excuses me from living in holiness. We're living in a time when one of the compromises is justification after another, after another, after another that has led to us as a church not being different and therefore we remain silent. We're living in a day and time where purity is a topic that has been suffocated with the statement, I have a right to. We're living in a day and time when holding one another accountable is now considered judgment. And I admit that often holding one another accountable has been done so without love, which is its own separate issue. But nevertheless, we have steered clear from holding one another accountable in a loving manner. Sanctification in our lives has been promoted as unnecessary because we have learned to justify everything in our lifestyle through the lens of relativism and through the lens of grace. We've used grace as a license, as a permission slip to dismiss us from sanctification. And with all of this happening, the church's heart has grown cold. And we have lost our love, and in losing our love, we have lost our voice. And in losing our voice, we have lost our roar. But friend, there's hope. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Friend, the Spirit is still speaking to us. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit is still speaking to us. The Holy Spirit is still necessary for a healthy church. Come on, somebody. The gifts of the Spirit are needed now in the church more than ever. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Pastor, what does this mean? It means that Jesus still restores. And there's this beautiful picture of eternity that's presented. Notice that he says, we'll eat of the tree of life. As a reference to the Genesis original sin where Adam, oh, Adam, where Adam and Eve caused this great divide between us and our Creator. You know the Bible says that Adam used to walk in the coolness of the evening with God standing right next to him. What was that like? What was it like to be able to walk alongside of God and say, Hey, just wondering. Sloths, why? Just wondering. Snakes. Just wondering, why did you create that? What was it like to walk hand in hand with God? And this verse says, I'll restore you back to that place. I'll restore you. And not only that, but you will inherit eternity where we walk hand in hand with the God who created us. Church, it's time. I'm going to say that again. It's time. It's time to get back to our first love. It's time to call on the Holy Spirit in a whole new way. It's time to seek to win people rather than arguments. It's time to exemplify Christ-like love in every area of our life. It's time to challenge one another doctrinally in a healthy manner so that we can show ourselves as studying and approved so that whenever somebody comes to us and says, hey, Christian, why do you hold this to be sacred? We can, we can defend ourselves and eventually lead them to a conversation about Jesus. It's time. In conclusion, our culture needs a roaring church. And I'm not talking about just making noise. Anybody can do that. I'm talking about a roar that has a purpose. It's time for the church to restore intellectual study and proclamation of the truth that we claim and hold on to. 
Do you know that what you and I have is far different than any religion out there? Where every other religion, where, where you have Muhammad who is, who is saying, you know, if you do this, then you might gain eternity. You might, but you got to earn it. As a matter of fact, missionary friends of mine have made this point that whenever you ask somebody who comes from an Islamic background and you say, do you believe that you'll spend eternity in God? Their response is, I hope so. Then you have Buddha who says, just keep disciplining your behaviors and maybe you'll earn eternity. Maybe, but it's a long shot and it's not likely. And then Jesus comes along. Don't you love it? And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. There was something different about him, friends. Come on, somebody. And you and I have that confidence and that hope that we hold on to. And it's not an empty hope. It's time to return to our first love where everything that we do and say is full of passionate love of Christ and the desire to become more like Him. And lastly, it's time to refuse compromise. The Bible is the word spoken by God to the heart of man. It does not need changed. It does not need updated. And there is no reason for us to remain silent on the subject. We no longer can allow the world to define us. So I'm going to say that again. We can no longer allow the world to define Christian standards. We can no longer bow down to just, just hush, Christian. That's offensive. And I recognize that the manner in which we present truth makes a difference, but there is a huge difference in avoiding the topic altogether. It's time for you and I to return to speaking truth. Because, friend, it is the only hope for mankind right now. It is the only place that can truly restore man and align us and restore us back to the garden, just like Adam walking in the cool evening with God. If you're here with us, would you stand to your feet and bow your heads? I'm going to ask if you're joining us on live stream, would you bow your head with me? every head bowed and every eye closed I asked Mike to lead us in this song the heart of worship I'm coming back to that original place God where I first came to know you I'm coming back to that place where there was zeal where there was passion where there was excitement and I wanted to know everything about you and I wanted to know everything about your word and why you did this and why you created that and why the son of God made such truth claiming statements, such absolute statements when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This song says, God, take me back to that place. Take me back to that place where I was so full of passion that compromise was beyond anything that I could think at the time. And as Mike sings this song, here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. If you're joining us on live stream or if you're in this place, I'm going to ask you, would you, I, I know that you might feel ridiculous if you're tuning in from your living room, but come on, there is beauty and humility. I'm going to ask that we would just lift our hands toward heaven and let's make this song our prayer. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, Jesus, where it's all about you, Lord. Take me back to that original place. God, I want to return to my first love and that's with my relationship with you and I also want to send the invitation. If you're joining us on live stream this morning and you say, Pastor, I feel like I have fallen away from God. I feel like I've walked away from my faith. Or maybe you can't remember a moment in time when you said, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I want to extend that invitation to you that, friend, Jesus is still in the business of restoring what is broken. And I want to make this a moment right now where I promise you, if you mean these words and you cry out to him, the Bible says it's this easy. Repent, he hears, he restores. Your life will never be the same from this moment on. So I'm going to ask if that's you on our live stream, would you bow your head with me and would you just repeat these words after me once again? There's nothing magical about my words, but it's all about your heart. 
If you truly desire for Jesus to be Lord of your heart, you've got to mean it. Would you repeat after me? Would you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I recognize that you are Lord. Would you come into my life? Forgive me for everything I've done. Restore me, Lord. I welcome you into my heart. Amen. And if you're joining us on live stream or here in the building and you say, Pastor, I've done that before, can I challenge you this morning to make it a point, church? Let's make it a point to get back to our first love by making these words our prayer. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it all started and it all began with you. Mike, would you lead us? Church, would you make this your prayer this morning? I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, God. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. When the music fades, and all is swept away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's away that will bless your heart. I'll bring. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And I'm coming back to the heart of it's all about you, God. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it in. When it's all about you, it's all about you. When it's all about you, it's all about you. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about Him, right? It's all about Him, church, amen? The only way, the only hope for humanity right now is if we make it all about Him. Is that our culture makes it all about Him, and that our churches, that we make it all about about him. And I just want to be clear, I know that I made some pretty bold statements today. If there's anything that you want to talk about in regards to what I've said today, please feel free to give us a, a give me an email, a shout out. I would love to discuss that with you. My heart is never to offend, but I've also come to the realization right now, friend, that truth is now being called hate speech. In our culture, truth is being labeled as hate speech. Truth is being labeled as judgy. Truth is being called, you're, you're saying this, but there's no love. And I hope that it was apparent today that everything that was said here today was from a heart of love. It's never my intent to come across in an offensive, unloving way, but I also have to recognize, and we as the church have to recognize, that as our culture has drifted away from the cross, truth is going to become that much more offensive. And the manner in which we present truth makes all the difference. There's a vast difference between somebody being offended by what you said versus being offended by how you said it. We've got to present truth in a loving way. Amen, church? Amen. Would you bow your heads one more time with us as we dismiss?
Lord Jesus, once again, I just thank you so much that we stand on hope today. That there's hope in the cross. That there's hope that is restored to us when we come to know you. Lord Jesus, I pray that as we leave this place and as we, uh, uh, as we close our laptops or shut off our uh, iPhones or iPads, however we're joining into this service, Lord, I pray that as we step away from this moment, that the truth that you have spoken to us today would last. Father, we're sorry if we've made, about the, made the church about anything else aside from you because we recognize that you are the only way. So Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be an effective church. God, help us to love those around us when it's difficult to show love. And Father, I pray, I pray that for such a time as this, that you would stir up the wells of revival in this nation. That you would restore the roar of the church, Father. Father, that we would be in restored relationship with you. God, we ask that you would heal our land. We call on you today. We repent, Lord Jesus, and we humbly ask that you would touch and heal our land, Lord Jesus, and that you would restore the heart of stone of man with the heart of flesh. May your will be done, Lord. We ask this all through the precious and the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everybody said, and everybody shouted, amen. Hey, it was so good to be with you today. Just want to remind that next Sunday, June 14th, two services, 10 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. We cannot wait to see you. Amen. Amen. God bless you.